Capital has always claimed to love its children, but it only loves its idea of children. Whether the under-21 population is described as children, youth, adolescents, teenagers, dependents, underagers, or juveniles, they are the primary pool of sacrificial victims for Capital's engine. Capital has never protected its youth in spite of its protestations and legislations to the contrary. Rather, it breaks their desire, fills them with guilt, treats them as slaves, transforms them into micro-consuming machines, exposes them to unbearable amounts of boredom, and when necessary, will even put them on the sacrificial altar of the law and execute them. Youth are imprisoned from the moment they can be removed from the family, not just in juvenile detention, asylums, addiction clinics, and other houses of horror, but in daycare and schools. Here they are prepared for a life of drudgery, boredom, false pleasures, and wage slavery. The overwhelming tedium and relentless boredom inspired by authoritarian education slowly becomes bearable as youth gradually adjust to having their lives stolen and trademarked as the property of capital. School takes psychologically integrated youth and transmutes them into fragmented beings. Each individual's desires, interests, and needs are punished if expressed. The only acceptable behavior is that which falls into the definition of a good student, a passive receptacle for information. 
School steals the capacity for autonomous action. Youth become little more than passive information receptacles and conduits. They sit at their desks, do their assignments, and listen to the master's voice. What is the difference between watching the blackboard and hearing the teacher and listening to and watching the master on television? There is no difference. They are both passive forms of consuming information that is pre-selected by capital. School fragments time. The day is not a continuum or an ever-expanding set of possibilities. It is a predetermined schedule sliced into uniform periods. No one thinks or creates under such conditions. One simply performs alienating tasks. This is only preparation for factory and office work, where these false conditions of temporality and of separation will continue until death. School only teaches information that will help people to function within the capitalist system. It never explains how information can be applied in other ways and in other social contexts. All information, the humanities, the fine arts, the social sciences, and science and math, are only to be used in the service of capital. Education in late capital is only preparation for entry into the workforce and a socialization mechanism of the status quo. Education continually withholds from you the qualities that could make education valuable. Criticality and creativity are treated as indiscretions that characterize the folly of you. That which makes you brilliant, desirable, and artistic is interpreted as immature and dangerous. Those who resist remaining passive and isolated from one another will be drugged with Prozac or Ridlin, or they will be housed in any of the many institutions of punishment that capital has constructed. The truth is that all of capital institutions are houses of punishment, and the only degree of difference is the difference between the quarters of a field slave and the quarters of a house slave.
As if the insult of school is not enough, youth are the bottom rung of wage slaves, doomed to work in food service, retail, unskilled manufacture, and janitorial services. The fate of youth is to be tortured by ideologues by day and worked to death for a scandalous wage at night. In the workplace, as well as in school, youth are taught that productivity is work, that is, time and space lacking pleasurable stimulation and meaningful social contact. The workplace ensures that youth will learn that others are only competitors that hinder them from acquiring desired goods. The workplace kills any possibility of creating social space based on mutual desire. The workplace further reinforces the futility of voluntary cooperation for emergent ends. Youth are told that by accepting the wage offered by an employer, that they must only meet the needs of the workplace and sacrifice their own needs and wishes, desires, for the good of profit. Work begins the process of turning youth into cyborgs. Technology has no liberating purpose in the workplace. It exists as a means to extend the bodies of youth into rationalized engines of exchange. Work withholds all that can make technology liberating. The technology of work is not open to general usage. It functions only within the particular parameters of the means and process necessary for production. Work socializes youth to believe that they cannot function without the technology of work that it is necessary part of their identity and role. Youth are thereby turned into slaves who desire the change which bind them and fear engaging the process that will transform their chains into weapons of liberation.
intense consumption binds youth even more tightly to the work machine. The youth of the middle and privileged classes are also useful to the extent that they are good consumers. Capital believes that members of this demographic may use 100% of their funds as they please. Youths who do not have to provide basic food, clothing, or shelter are the ultimate candidates for spending their money on the junk goods of capital. Be a rebel. Buy Nike. To encourage excessive buying, youth are kept locked in the secure spaces of consumption. Malls, arcades, multiplexes, theme parks, and other centers abound in order to train youth to desire that which is useless to them. Once outside the home, the school, and the workplace, the architecture of consumption is youth's last remaining space. Here the total domination of youth by capital is completed, and youth has no space to go where its desires and needs are not sacrificed for profit. Under such conditions, youth become a nomadic tribe unable to escape the boundaries of the territory which oppresses them. In the spaces of consumption, youth are denied any rights other than the freedom to choose between and purchase commodities. They must either buy or risk expulsion from the space, and are told that this is how to have fun and to express their freedom. In all the spaces where youth are allowed to enter, they are watched by authority and denied any privacy. Like prisoners in a cell, youth are on display to authority 24 hours a day. Youth are told that they have freedom of movement, but they may only move between spaces over which they have no control. Whether they are at home, school, work, or in a so-called leisure space, they have no choice about the environment they occupy, neither in a physical nor in a symbolic sense. Their surroundings are never of their own making. If youth attempt to appropriate a space and make it their own, their activities are disrupted or attacked by police and other security forces. Youth have no spatial autonomy, no space to design, nowhere to organize, no place to express themselves without fear. They are denied any sense of public and are left only with profound alienation or pathetic self-delusion. The greatest lie ever told to youth is that they are incapable of governing themselves and that they need an authority to guide them toward a greater good. People cherish and maintain this lie all of their lives and because of it willingly submit to the authority of the corporate state. In this sense, all people share in youth culture no matter what their age. As anarchists, our goals are to remedy this sad situation. We want to create open public spaces to let desire dictate the mode and means of what we produce, to consume for the purpose of pleasure and satisfaction in convivial environment, to create social forms through processes of mutual direct consent as to the nature of rules, obligations, and activities, to develop the capacity of all individuals for direct autonomous action, and to resist the pernicious hegemony of pan-capitalism by any means necessary. Quit work. Educate yourself.